Well, we're very happy to see you here to hear this lecture because this is going to be a big treat. Closer. This lecture will be a big treat, and we're very happy to see you here. So Henry Matthews will be presenting your favorite subject. Oh, we forgot to bring your book. Um, Islamic Architecture, Miracle of Structure, Space, and Surface. Yeah, I wouldn't be here today if it hadn't been for Susan winning a Fulbright Fellowship to teach at a university in Istanbul. So I tacked along and I thought I'd better have something to do when I was there. So I learned all I could about the Mosque of Istanbul uh, and uh, two other cities, uh, Bursa and Edirne, and ended up writing a book, The Mosques of Istanbul, which was published by Scala. And uh, I meant to bring a couple of copies with me, but I will have them next time. But they are, all my books are in the library. Let, I think we have to be serious and do two minutes worth of history so that we get oriented. In 610, the Prophet Muhammad received his first revelations in Mecca. They became the basis of the Quran. He rejected the polytheistic religions of the Arab society in favor of the belief in one God. He did not write the Quran. He was illiterate, uh, but uh, he, he, it was written down by scribes and has been virtually unchanged since then. With the encouragement of his wife, Kadiya, a prosperous trader and also his employer, he began to preach and make converts to his new monotheistic religion. He respected Christianity and Judaism. He referred to them as the people of the book. The traditional leaders in Mecca opposed him. Years of strife follow. In 622, the prophet, with 70 Muslim families, migrated from Mecca to Medina. This migration, or hijra, is considered the beginning of the Muslim era. In 628, a peace treaty was made between Mecca and Medina. In 632, the death of the Prophet Muhammad, Abu Bakr became the first caliph. Within two years, he had united the tribes of Arabia. So this was a tremendous upheaval in the Middle East. Well. We better have a map at the beginning. Uh, Mecca and Medina are, are here. Uh, Jerusalem, Cairo, Jerusalem. Uh, can't read the small print. Um, Damascus. Damask Damascus. And then way over on the western side, end of the Mediterranean, uh, is Tunisia. Uh, there's the great mosque of Caruan here and Cordoba in Spain, where we will go in a few minutes. Very happy to be going there today. What kind of, oh, what kind of architectural precedent was there for Arabs? Not really much because they tended to be uh, um, wandering people with their flocks and their camels. Uh, and so I, I will exaggerate that point. But when they began to gain territory, uh, they came into uh, places where there were amazing Roman buildings, some of them domed, some of them that we probably know nothing about because they've, did, did, they've disappeared since then. But in Jerusalem, there was the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, uh, built by the Emperor Constantine in 326, rebuilt many times and still uh, a place of uh, pilgrimage uh, all, all the time. But following the Roman 
habit of building domes. Uh, the Muslims built the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem on the Temple Mount. Uh, and this uh, was an extraordinarily fine structure uh, with a dome, dome held aloft on eight arches supported by columns, somewhat in the manner of the Church of San Vitale, which we saw last week. Uh, and this, what is the rock? The rock uh, has two meanings. It's the place where Abraham was pre prevented by an angel from sacrificing his son Isaac. And then it was uh, the destination of the prophet's night journey. Uh, I haven't time to talk about that, but let's stick with the architecture. And so this is a magnificent domed structure built in Jerusalem. It stands on the Temple Mount. Uh, it's the outside was rebuilt in the 16th century uh, by the architect Sinan, whom we will meet later. Uh, and it was given that beautiful golden covering to the dome. Now, what was the first mosque? Well, probably it was at Mohammed's house uh, in Medina. There were a few rooms uh, at the left-hand upper end, uh, and then a covered place. And the prophet would stand on a tree trunk, it was about here, I think, uh, and deliver his sermons. Those were rooms for his wives? Yes. Yeah. And since you mention his wives, it was a polygamous society. His wife died uh, at some point, but he had many other wives, not because he was lascivious, but because they had lost his, their husbands fighting for the faith, and so he took them in. That point needs emphasizing. So what were the requirements for a mosque? A spacious prayer hall which sheltered the people from the sun and the rain. And it had to have an axis, a central axis, on which this uh, photograph uh, is centered, leading to a niche in the wall, which is known as the mirab. And this niche in the wall is on the side pointing towards Mecca. And the Arabs were incredibly clever at knowing the points of the compass and getting them accurately towards Mecca, which would be quite difficult out there in the desert. And then another requirement uh, beyond the mirab, the niche in the wall facing Mecca, uh, was the minbar, uh, the pulpit from which Friday sermons uh, were given. So these two elements uh, appear in many mosques. Another requirement is a minaret, a tower from which the muezzin gives the call to prayer. I know how early it is in the morning because we had one about uh, 30 feet from our apartment in Istanbul. <laughs> Uh, and so we always knew when was the time. And the Muezzin determines when you can't distinguish, where, as soon as you can dis dis distinguish between a white hair and a black hair, you will know uh, that it's light enough. And minarets took all kinds of different forms. Uh, they can be multi-tiered multi towers, or even one at Samara in Iraq, which is a, a spiral. And I re, re, certainly remember standing looking at this minaret uh, in upper, looking out over us, upper, upper Mesopotamia from Mardin in 
southeastern Turkey. And the final and very important requirement was a place for ablutions, a fountain uh, where people preparing uh, to go into the mosque could wash uh, their feet and their hands uh, and their mouth. And you always see uh, people uh, washing there. Now, one very different kind of requirement is more a prohibition. Representation of human and animal forms is prohibited, so there are no paintings. In this slide, you see a Christian altar uh, with a beautiful Madonna and child supported on either side by wealthy donors. That's important in the Christian faith. Uh, and, uh, but all ornament is abstract, can be flowers or plants or calligraphy, but no representation of people. Now, when you go into a mosque, you'll notice how incredibly clear the space is. I remember going to Westminster Abbey and thought I'd be taken on a, thought I would join a tour. And the leader of the tour talked almost exclusively about the tombs. He didn't gaze up at the magnificent vaulting overhead. That seemed to be secondary to the tombs. But as you know, in a lot of Christian churches, there is a lot of clutter, memorial clutter. I think that... I don't, I don't have it. No, it wasn't. Um, and then another thing very common uh, to Islamic mosques is a geometric ordering of the space. This plan showing a courtyard approaching a mosque and the mosque itself. Uh, and you can see that there's uh, an ordering system uh, that is very uh, rigorous. Structural ingenuity also. Uh, the one on the left we will meet in Cordoba in Spain, but we'll see it next week in an Italian Renaissance church in Turin. So from the Pantheon in Rome, which was a great mass of solid concrete, to Hagia Sophia in Istanbul, to one of the final mosques uh, of the 16th century architect Sinan, we see a progression from less structure and more light. Look how the windows come in all around, filling the prayer hall with light. One element that is unique to Muslim architecture is the mukarnas, a subtle way of making a transition between two surfaces, which you can see in a recess in a wall, in a niche in the wall, or around a minaret, both in Isfahan. And decorative abstract ornament on surfaces, often very, very uh, fully covering the walls and dome of the mosque. Yes, that's right. Yes, that, good, good point. Calligraphy, uh, and they, they developed many styles of calligraphy, some of which were uh, more decorative. Uh, oh, no, I didn't need to press that button. Uh, so, so this is in Isfahan. And then the next one uh, is in Istanbul. 
quite common in early mosques were reused Roman columns. If the Roman had built, built, built all kinds of structures uh, that were crumbling, why not support the roofs of mosques on them? And the absolutely best example anywhere in the world is the mosque uh, in uh, Cordoba in Spain. Uh, and this also illustrates polychrome masonry. They loved alternating red and white stones uh, to give life to those arches. Another architectural element, though we don't see it so much in Turkey, is the Eivan, which was a huge niche in a wall. Whereas while the Romans would use columns standing forward as a portico to emphasize the center, the Eivan uh, was on a flat, was a recess in a flat wall surface and it is ornamented richly with the kind of design that we've been talking about. Courtyards uh, were essential spaces to larger mosques. You come into, and sometimes uh, the entire courtyard will be full of people spreading out their prayer mats if all the places under cover uh, are occupied. So this map shows um, many mosques uh, here. Have we, have we, did I show this before? No. <coughs> here we have Mecca and Medina. And there is Damascus. We'll be going to the mosque in Damascus soon. Uh, Caruan, Cordoba in Spain. Here's one I haven't seen uh, in Iraq, uh, with the one with the spiral minaret, which is absolutely magnificent. Huge courtyard. At Karwan in Tunisia, here's another one with a vast courtyard. Uh, and here we get that central axis leading to the mirab. And the minaret uh, is a tower in many stages. Here is the interior of the mosque at Karawan. Of course, there are carpets all over the floors. Sometimes a whole mosque is uh, filled with a fitted carpet, but often it's made up of many carpets donated by all kinds of different people, rich and rare uh, oriental carpets. I'm sure that these columns were reused. For one thing, they don't quite match each other. And uh, another, they're obviously Roman. Uh, good old Corinthian capitals on the right there. Oh, I, d I don't think so. They were very good at carrying columns around, which is hard. In Cairo, there are a great many mosques. Uh, this one, with, with the very crisp geometry, uh, appeals to me. The minaret is a high tower standing uh, on, on the left, and then this structure, maybe a treasury. I'm not sure. The great mosque at Damascus, which I had the pleasure to visit a few years ago, uh, has an absolutely vast courtyard uh, and a three, uh, something like a three-aisled basilica on one side. And you may be able to make out on the plan that in the middle of that, there's a very small dome. So. There's the plan uh, of the, the mosque. 
with a great deal of prayer space and the mirab is in this position here. There's a view up into that dome. So it's rather like an early Christian church. Uh, there's St. Paul without the walls uh, and the great mosque at Damascus uh, on the right. This was a Christian church? Yes, it was, it was actually a Christian church that they remodeled and built around. I'm sorry. That's, that, that's very, very good. Grab a mic if you like. No, I'll be quiet. I'm sorry. No, I like your insertions. You have some very important things to say. So there is the uh, mirab uh, and the minbar. Uh, the pulpit. Now we come to a very exciting episode in the history of Islam. Abd al-Rahman, known as the Falcon, was the leader of the uh, uh, sorry of the Umayyad kingdom uh, in uh, in Damascus. And he was driven out of his kingdom. He actually ran away from the conquerors who had burst into his palace and swam across a river with his brother who drowned. He couldn't go back for his brother and only just made it with his life. He ran and he ran all the way to Spain. Uh, he made his way through Spain picking up followers as he went. He must have been an incredibly charismatic person. And he arrived in Spain, uh, which then was called El Andalus. And there he began the construction of the great mosque of Cordoba in 786. He was the first ruler of Umayyad, Spain. And if we look at the picture coming up now, you will see that it was built in many stages. This is the part completed by Abd al-Rahman, and then there was more that followed. And later on, when it was taken by Christians, a Christian cathedral uh, was built in the middle. And as some commentators have stated, what a shame that such a mediocre cathedral could stand in this beautiful space. Have any of you been there? Isn't, isn't this astonishing? I, I'm, I'm, I will never forget this. So these are borrowed Roman columns. Uh, this was an important Roman city, and they, they found lots of columns with this gray marble, which is very, uh, stands out against the horseshoe arches with their polychrome voussoirs. What a place. And um, absolutely amazing. Uh, it's the most elaborate mirab that ever was created. The actual mirab is in a niche in, in the wall here. And, uh, but in front of it is a compartment uh, with slightly different uh, arches. And then when we look up from there, uh, we see uh, the dome uh, over the compartment with the mirab in it. And look at the architectural ingenuity of that eight arches cross its corners, diagonally intersecting each other. And next week, when I get to the Italian Renaissance, I will take you to a favorite church in Turin, which follows that same scheme. Whether the architect invented it a second time or whether he had been to Cordoba, I cannot say. And then here is the cathedral sticking out of the top of the mosque. 
And then the, while we're in Spain, let's have a quick look at the Alhambra Palace in Granada. Uh, an absolutely astonished, who's been to Granada? Uh, the, the usual suspects, <laughs> yes. Uh, it was built over a long period of time in a fantastical manner. I don't, we, we've seen nothing that can help, help us to imagine how these architects could work uh, in, in this way. For, first, there's this beautiful courtyard with these elaborate arches uh, on slender columns, and in the middle of fountain with a ring of lions around it. And then interior spaces, uh, interior spaces uh, which boggle the mind. They also boggled my camera a bit. It was not a, not a very bright day, so they're a little fuzzy, but I think you can get the idea. The ingenuity, uh, the originality, it's absolutely astonishing. You remember I mentioned the mukarnas, which was a means of progressing from one surface to another, uh, and this can crop up all over the place. And then next to uh, the Alhambra uh, is the beautiful garden of the Generalife uh, with this long pool with fountains putting jets of water into it. Well, now it's time. We have to go very, we have to move through the world very quickly. I'm slightly ashamed of bombarding you with so much stuff. In Isfahan, a great city uh, in Iran, uh, was the capital of Shah Abbas, who reigned f from 1587 to 1649. Here he is receiving a delegation of ambassadors from the, from the Uzbeks. And this is the central feature uh, of this city, uh, the Maidan, the great marketplace or central square. The French would call it the Place de la Concorde or something. Uh, but here it is, the Maidan uh, with two, at least two mosques on it. And you can see exactly how the mosques are, are twisted from the grid of the city uh, to lead exactly to Mecca. And there you see uh, that Avan feature again uh, in the Shah's mosque. And we go from there into an interior space uh, that we saw before. But my gosh, isn't that incredible that this is all covered with tiles and has been there for hundreds of years. Such craftsmanship. And again, we have the decoration, the ornamentation, which is abstract uh, and not showing human figures or animals. And then the theological college, the madrasa of the Shah in Isfahan. I remember when I went there, it was about 125 in the shade, and I was outside in the street looking at that entrance, and then somehow walking into a cart courtyard with water, whether it works really by lowering the temperature or whether it's just psychological. I have a feeling it's psychological. It seemed to be beautifully cool in here, though not much breeze could have got in. Isfahan is well worth going to. Not so easy nowadays. There's these blue domes with encircling patterns are so magnificent. Well, let's now move to the Ottomans. 
it's going to take, I've got a lot to show, I've got too much to show you, but I will do my best. The map shows the Ottoman Empire. The lighter color, the lighter brown, uh, is the way that it was in 1683. Went almost to the gates of Vienna. By the 19th century, by until 19, for, uh, sorry, till 1914, the Ottoman Empire was reduced to the darker color, but it did go down as far as Mecca and Medina. So now I'm going to run through very speedily a group of Ottoman mosques in the three capitals of Bursa, Edirne, and Istanbul. I'll show them on a map. We'll look at the evolution of structural design, issues of monumentality, which is present, and human scale, which is also present without there being a conflict between the two. And then the significance of the coulie, a complex uh, of buildings for social purposes. So here is the map. Istanbul uh, is top right on the Bosphorus, which runs between the Sea of Marmara and the Black Sea. To the south is Bursa the first Ottoman capital before they had conquered Constantinople, and the second one was Edirne. So the evolution of the Ottoman mosque uh, goes from relatively simple to more complex and definitely uh, more decorative. This uh, is the Orhan Ghazi mosque in Bursa. He was the first Ottoman uh, leader. Uh, he, it was he uh, who conquered Bursa, but he did not survive to conquer Constantinople. The interior is a relatively small space, and you notice that there's a means of going from the square of the walls to the circle of the dome using a device that the, uh, that the uh, Byzantine builders did not use. Uh, these are called squinchies, uh, and they could be decorative as these ones were. Or uh, th there's an elaborate system which is known uh, as the the Turkish Circle, I think. Is that right? Or is that the group I used to meet at the University of Washington? <laughs> or, or both. Uh, but the, these little sort of, uh, it looks like origami, these little folded paper darts uh, that have been put around make the transition uh, from the square walls to the circle of the dome. Yes, Th this is a very unusual but I think it's called the Turkish Circle, right? And then the next one is the great mosque, the Ulu Jami at Bursa, uh, 1396, which had 20 domes. You look at the interior space, you see these vast columns, heavy enough, strong enough to carry those 20 domes covered with calligraphy. Uh, this is a uh, really, oh yes, I couldn't, you couldn't see that one yet. This is a really memorable uh, in interior. And then a transitional mosque that's very important if you're trying to follow the evolution that went on, but may seem quite confusing. Uh, it's called the Ushcherefili Jami which means the three balconied mosque, though the balconies are only on the minaret. But the important stuff is happening uh, in the interior. First, we go through a courtyard, and courtyards became absolutely standard in the big mosques. And then we come to a prayer hall with one big dome in the center and two small domes 
on either side, as you can see in the plan. And I have a little diagram which will change as we move through the evolution uh, in a series of slides. So this is the central dome uh, of the Uch Sherefeli Jami. Jami, of course, is the word for uh, mosque. And we have, mustn't be confused by the fact uh, that it begins with a C, which is pronounced as a J. And here is the very plain uh, prayer hall with two huge columns in the space between the large dome and the smaller domes. And now we come in 1453 to the, to the conquest of Constantinople by Mehmet II, who was known as Fatih uh, to the Ottomans. And I talked, when, we were, when I was talking about Hagia Sophia last week, I mentioned uh, the conqueror's visit uh, to the Christian cathedral, how he was astonished, he looked up into the dome and saw something that isn't there now, the head of a very venerable man who looked down on him, whose eyes followed him, wherever he went. I don't mind repeating that one. And you see how the light pours in through so many windows. Let's just take a quick look at the plan of Hagia Sophia and see how it is echoed somewhat in some of the mosques that follow, uh, but never exactly copied. So this one has a central dome and two half domes, making it into an elongated space. And I will now show you uh, a mosque. Uh, the mosque built for the conqueror was actually fell down in an earthquake and was rebuilt uh, more or less on the same lines. But you can see how this one has its central dome and then a half dome uh, over the apse and then three small domes on either side. And so that's a diagram of the Utsharefeli one in Bursa, in, in Edirne, and this one uh, carrying on a, a, same, a, a similar evolution. Here's a view down. I was not flying up here, but someone kindly took this picture uh, of the uh, Fatih Mosque, the Conqueror's Mosque. Here it is. And then we move on to another one which follows the same kind of, the same kind of plan, but this time the prayer hall is in, enlarged to have a central dome and two half domes, and then four domes on either side. So look at the ordered geometry of this. There's the court, the courtyard uh, at the entry uh, with tiny domes uh, around the four sides of it. And this one is like a Christian church with transepts, uh, even uh, though it's not quite the same purpose. And there, and there and now we, we go from a central dome with two half domes on either side to three on either side and one half dome. And the Bezit Mosque has gone the whole way. Uh, it's a logical progression uh, in the geometry. Look at those small domes on one side and we just get a glimpse of the central dome, and now we get a view up into it. And now we come to the period of Suleiman, known as the Magnificent, 
uh, in the West and Suleiman the lawgiver uh, in Turkey and his architect Sinan who was the chief architect of three sultans over a period uh, of uh, 50 years. And where we will see the wonderful domes of Brunelleschi and Michelangelo, who both managed to build one. And Brunelleschi almost saw his dome finished. Michelangelo never did. But Mimar Sinan went on and on, building mosque after mosque. He had a last, large atelier of draftsmen uh, who would design them with, under his direction. Uh, I think he was responsible uh, in the whole of Turkey of about 40 mosques, which is, puts, I, I can't denigrate Brunelleschi in any way. He's one of my favorite people in the whole world. But, uh, he didn't quite pull that one off. So this is the Shezada Mosque, not far from the Suleyabanye Mosque. Uh, if, if, I, if you take a look at my book, there's a copy of the library, you'll see a map uh, showing how you can go from mosque to mosque uh, along the top of a hill. This one has a central dome and then a half dome on all four sides. So there is uh, an evolution uh, which reaches uh, its peak. So if we stand outside it and look up at the dome, uh, we see the central dome rising high. And then in the four corners are, are four smaller domes. Then there is this item here. Can anyone guess or tell me what this is? Why would you have a dome so small as that? For uh, lower levels? Here. Uh, well, there are four of them. It's, it, comes, it comes over this pier. It's a weight tower. You, you remember how Gothic uh, buttresses, flying buttresses, often had a pinnacle on top just to add a little bit more downwards weight. That's exactly what this is. Uh, absolutely it's astonishing. This, this man really was an engineer. In fact, I, I've, I oh no. So here's the dome inside with a ring of windows all around it. Uh, an idea started, it started in Hagia Sophia and the weight coming down uh, to the piers below. And there you see that on the right, you see that transfer of the weight. O over here is that weight tower and a massive pier. And then there are three arches in under each of the half domes. That's a good question. Probably not. So there is Sinan's first major mosque. The Shizada was the crown prince who died of smallpox. And his father, Suleiman, was absolutely devastated by it and prayed by uh, his body for five nights or something like that. And then he was, so instead, uh, he, the next sultan was Selim, uh, who is also known as Selim the Sot. There was Selim the Grim, uh, who was his father, his grandfather and Selim the Sot, uh, but I'm told that I sometimes malign him. So here is this beautiful Shezada mosque. Oh, I'll keep doing that. And then here we get the skyline of Istanbul from the Golden Horn uh, with the Suleimanye Mosque. Um, 
the, the, the largest one almost in, in the middle. And then here we have an, an aerial view of it, looking down not just on the mosque, mosque, but on a huge complex of buildings. This complex was built there for social purposes. It included a kitchen uh, to feed pilgrims coming there uh, and to feed the poor, a library, a hospital, clinics, all kinds of everything that was needed, schools. And that was how the mosque differed so much from the medieval cathedral. If we look at the English cathedrals, they were often in a monastery, and the cathedral was the monastery church, but, there, but the buildings were mostly for the purposes of the monks. Uh, but the coulier, as it's called, was for the whole community. There, um, the, the, this one is the library. I'm not sure what this is, but there, there are so many different social purposes that were fulfilled there. And then we enter the precinct of the mosque uh, through a small gate, find ourselves on a broad walk. Uh, and there's a garden there where you see families picnicking. I don't think I include any in my show, but they're important. All the way, oh, I haven't got to this slide. All the way along here are places for ablution, just a stone slab to sit on and a tap in the wall to bring out the water. And then this is a beautiful gallery that I, is not really used for any purpose, uh, but it sort of humanizes this vast structure uh, by uh, giving it more of a human scale. We come into the Avlu, the court of the Suleimanye Mosque, once again, uh, you can see on either side of the main dome the weight towers, these elements here, uh, which resist the thrust from the dome. So the weight tower is built exactly over this pier. And then the central dome is flanked uh, not by four half domes, uh, but by two half domes and two spandrel walls, which have many, many windows in them. And I return to my point of how uncluttered this is compared with Westminster Abbey. The, the amount of light that comes in is astonishing. And you can see how efficient the engineering is. If he built 40 mosques, he must have had time to experiment. But I'm not, not aware of any of them collapsing. And look at the size of those arches between uh, the aisles and the central space. But we go outside, we have the human scale. I'm not sure whether, the, whether it was quite like this at Zuleman's time, but it's perfectly logical to put open air cafes here uh, in the coulier. And then here is the, ref the refectory and the kitchen uh, with the courtyard leading to them. So, Hundreds of people would have been fed here every day. And if Turkish food then was as good as it is now, they enjoyed it. Rustam Pasha uh, was uh, one of the uh, grand viziers of Suleiman. And he built this mosque uh, down near a marketplace. We, there's an entry 
a covered entry where people could pray outside, but then they go in and uh, they have the pleasure uh, of praying under this enormous dome uh, with the uh, blue uh, spandrels between the arches. These are sort of miniature, uh, what are they called? Pend miniature pendentives. Thank you, I needed you here, Grant. Here are the, uh, the mirab and the pulpit. And the colors are just absolutely incredible. Rustam Pasha was a pretty nasty man, but he expanded the tile works uh, near, uh, near Istanbul at Iznik and pr they produced gorgeous tiles. Now this is the view from an apartment we had. We had we lived in three places in Istanbul. Uh, this one was in Asia, the other two were in Europe. And we looked down on the mosque of the, of the Velidi Sultan, uh, the mother of a sultan who had come to the throne but was not yet of age. And there was a period w w called the rule of the women when there was one Velide sultan after another and they were very, very powerful people. And this beautiful mosque uh, was built for her. You enter it through a courtyard. It, it's a place where the old men in the village just sit and chat. Uh, and then we come uh, to this covered walk, uh, an arcade giving shade, the fountain for ablutions. This place is so amazingly welcoming and beautiful. But now we get to the largest of all the mosques towards the end of Suleiman's, Su Su Sinan's uh, life as the imperial architect. And this is in the city of Edirne, uh, up towards uh, the border with Greece and Bulgaria. Four great minarets. And you, they, they were very practical people. But you see this arch, it's not an entry to the mosque, it's the, uh, the entry to a, mar to a market. Uh, and on, I don't think I show a picture of that, but it's such a good idea to not to waste any space. So I can buy, compare it with Bourges Cathedral, uh, which Grant showed you not so long ago. Uh, look at those pinnacles on top of the flying buttresses. They are uh, like the weight towers uh, that stand around the dome. A there are tons and tons and tons of stone up there, which was hauled up there on the shoulders of very, very strong people. Uh, and that has to be that weight has to be balanced by these weight towers. And around it uh, is, you enter through a garden on some sides and a courtyard on the other. Uh, and the courtyard is so peaceful. How do they climb those minarets? Well, they don't anymore. But they, they have spiral staircases in them. They have a spiral staircase. These are no mean minarets. If you're going to be a muezzin, you'd have to take a, a strength test, climbing test. But now they just have a loudspeaker. I think, I think it's shocking. So here we are uh, in the Avlu, the courtyard. And again, there's that polychrome stone in the arches. 
look up into little, little domes above that, enter uh, through one of the several doorways into the cathedral, into, into the mosque, and here is its interior. And I just managed to finish it at 5 to 1. Uh, Sidan kept on experimenting with plans. You could have one dome and so many half domes. You could have uh, four arches, or you could have six arches, or, or you could have eight arches. This one has eight arches. And uh, some of them uh, have a half dome behind them, some a flat wall with windows. The man was a genius. And he had to know all of this before he laid the first stone. Yes. Yes, I think that, that's the first question. Yeah, he, must, he must have I don't, every bit of Is it turned on? Before he laid the first solid stone. Yes. Yes, I'm sure. So, other questions? Yes. Oh. You'll come next. Uh, you, it, 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 I, my understanding is the women had a special place within the, the mosque. Where was that? It varied. It, it, sometimes it was a sort of enclosed gallery that overlooked it, either at an upper level or a lower level. And while we were living in Istanbul, we heard that they changed all of that and that the women would go into the mosque. But it never actually seemed to happen, maybe in some cities, maybe, maybe in some different Muslim countries. But I never saw that in Istanbul. Uh, I just have a comment on the Grand Mosque in Cordoba. Uh, that was built on the site of a Visigoth church. And there is still a section of wall from the original church which has been incorporated in the outer wall of that mosque. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, again, you are adding something I wish I knew known before. The, the Cordoba Mosque is incredible. Well, I just wanted to make one little comment myself that most people that go to Istanbul go to the Blue Mosque, which you'll notice we didn't talk about. How does that fit into this whole story, Henry? Well, it fits in because it's next to Hagia Sophia, so it's easy. the tour bus only needs to park in one place. Yeah. Grant, it's give, give me. It's later, yes. I just had one comment earlier. The mosque at Damascus, that uh, part that looks like a Christian basilica is, it was, they uh, seized and, and remodeled an, an actual Christian church and then built that grand court around it. Henry, I was in, I spent a year in Sarajevo in Yugoslavia. Oh, yes. The Turks had been there for, what, 500 years or something. Yes. It was still very Turkish. It has the largest mosque in Europe outside of European Turkey. And I don't know, you, I guess you don't have pictures of it, but it was an I immense don't. mosque. I, I, if I could find one, I'll try to remember to put it in next time. It was also a mosque where the imam, every day, five times a day, climbed clear up the minaret to do the call to prayer. And... We stayed in a hotel near there once, and we, out our window we could see him with his beard blowing in the breeze doing the call to prayer. So it was one of the few, the only mosque, I guess, in Sarajevo that didn't use a loudspeaker, but it was notable for that. Where was it? Sarajevo in, oh. in Yugoslavia. There are some mosques in Thessaloniki also uh, in, in Greece, which was, of course, uh, an important Muslim town. Yes, I, I, must, I must try and find a picture of that. I've never been to Sarajevo. It's a pretty mosque. It's huge. Well, I, I well, just Any other questions? Yeah. Me? Yes. Oh. Here, take this. It's not on. Did they ever experiment with the Gothic pointed arch? That's a very interesting question. I think there are one or two examples, uh, but I mean, they got their arches from the Romans. Uh, and they carried on that way. Well, the Gothic arch developed during that same 
Of course. The Gothic arch developed during that same time, so they must have seen many examples of it. That's true. It has a different message than the dome, you know, pointing in one direction. <clears throat> well, the pointed arch uh, had solved prob problems of structure. It was, it was more efficient. They, if they wanted to build a high cathedral with vaults, the, point, the pointed arch made lots of sense. And I'm sure Grant told you a few weeks ago. Any other questions? Um, <clears throat> this the comment, I was interested in the um, minarets, uh, particularly <clears throat> early as Islam expanded across North Africa and into Spain. And you had uh, samples there of very different styles. I mean, yes. there was a sort of cylindrical pointed one, and then the <clears throat> there was an, another one that was kind of like a very slender wedding cake, uh, sort of stepped in towards yes, the top. Yes, <clears throat> And um, uh, interesting, most of us are uh, <clears throat> come late to Islamic architecture, but I was intrigued with um, somewhere, it uh, was commented that the, our skyscrapers in New York, that the Empire State Building got, was, had some influence from that, uh, was the Geraldo Tower and... Um, it's in uh, Granada, I think, or Seville. But anyway, th there was an influence from yes, yes. that stepped in top. Yes, that's true. That's a very, that's a very interesting point. Uh, something that, uh, that I want to mention is that when we, we arrived in Istanbul just after the earthquake uh, that took place very close to the city, um, not one, minaret, not one minaret fell. There was some cracking in the dome of one mosque I went into. Of course, it, it, it was miles from the epicenter, but still these structures stood up very well. We were on a bus ride to Ankara. We passed through, uh, is, is Nick, is it, where? where the earthquake was close to its epicenter, and we did see mosques that had fallen. Well, I think we probably have to leave this room now, but thank you for coming. <laughs>